Me. I've already. And maybe you pressed. should. Okay. Sure. No, it's not recording. It's not recording. It's recording. Okay. Should I share my screen, Bastian? Please go ahead. Start at the start. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Bastian Künzel and this lovely gentleman uh, on my virtual side uh, is Grant Douglas. And uh, we have been invited to, um, to spend this hour with you uh, in a way replicating something that we talked about at the Theater Europa Congress in Malta. Uh, which uh, Cindy really enjoyed, she said, and so she invited us to share this uh, also with um, the theater direct members. And of course, um, Grant and I were uh, honored to be invited and uh, gratefully said yes. Uh, so what we are uh, going to uh, maybe, Grant, do you want to uh, introduce yourself uh, to those that uh, have heard your name but only know the mysteries that surround it okay well my name as you can see is grant douglas um amongst other things i'm the uh, vice president of cita france and the cita france representative on the cita europa board um and i also work at uh, a management school in France, but I will tell you a little bit more about that later because it's really uh, quite a main part of what we'll be talking about. And uh, my name is Bastian Künzel. Uh, the, the two dots over the U probably give away that I'm German uh, by origin or at least by name, uh, but I, I live in Poland and Wrocław. Uh, in terms of CETAR, I had uh, a few positions I was Vice President of Theatre Poland twice, as uh, Vice President of Theatre Europa uh, for a while. And then I was the Program Chair for the Theatre Malta Congress. And I'm also currently uh, the Program Chair for the Theatre uh, Congress that will take place 2024 in Lille at the IESEC uh, School of Management. And uh, I am also uh, heading up the team, the election commission uh, that will soon launch a call for the new president, vice president, secretary, treasurer for CETA Europa. Um, but when I'm not busy volunteering with CETA, uh, I am a trainer and consultant and uh, working with TCO International, but also uh, freelancing and um, I teach intercultural communication, shockingly, uh, at the University of Wrocław in Poland. Yeah, um, yeah so we wanted to, uh, to quickly maybe uh, see who's here and where you're from, but because we have little time and you are many, uh, we thought we might utilize the chat for this. And so if you could be so free to put into the chat briefly, what sector you are mostly involved in, uh, in terms of training or education or helping other people learn, and what uh, and in what capacity, and also what brought you here today on this sunny Monday afternoon? Uh, please feel free to to uh, to write that in the chat so and uh, send it to everyone so that everyone can see who's here uh, and um, in what capacity you work in which sector. Uh, and what brought you here today. And then we can quickly see what um, or get back there and what illustrious group of um, interesting people we are surrounded by today. Okay. I, I'm not sure if it's me or if nobody is writing anything yet, <laughs> but I don't see anything yet. Wait, I don't. Uh, no. From, C uh, from Italy, Martina, and work in learning and development in corporate. Okay, teaching skills for managers, executive and public speakers, uh, coaching and training for scientists and international research teams. Very interesting. 
uh, freelance from Leipzig uh, at institutions of higher learning, uh, first meeting to attend. Happy to be here. Happy to have you, Anke. All right. I think the next ones are writing a lot. Okay. Mm, the little essays. <laughs> uh, diversity, competence, and intercultural communication train on consultant at Indigo. Uh, diversity consultant living in Amsterdam. Good afternoon. Also located in the Netherlands. Intercultural team coach and trainer. Uh, Jackie, intercultural trainer and coach and DEI. University lecturer in Vienna and independent trainer and coach. Uh, dialing in from New Hampshire, uh, very nice. Uh, freelance coach and trainer, university and uh, part-time mentoring manager at HR department, University of Cologne, trainer, professor, researcher, uh, UK global learning and training, LT, educational industry, uni lecturer, trainer and consultant. All right, what a... What a group. Wow. Well, a lot of people involved in higher education. Mm -hmm. That is, fits. Which is very much what we'll be talking about um, today. So we've got a few more coming in. Switzerland and Belgium. Training life cycle. Um, Meta from Norway. Yes, Meta, we do know each other from way back when. South <laughs> Africa who lives in, in Germany. A freelance expert consultant, intercultural trainer, and lecturer. Fantastic. Okay. Teen from Toronto, Canada. Well, welcome to Europe, uh, at least virtually. Uh, and Maya from Italy. Fantastic. Okay. So, what Grant and I uh, were were planning to do and talk about is, um, on the one hand, a framework uh, that that I've been developing a few years ago uh, on on learning experience design, so how we can structure and organize and think about the learning process, and 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 structure what happens when in a way that is. Um, very humane and very logical and very momentum building uh, based on on the idea of narrative identity and that people experience their lives as a story. So I would talk a little bit about that framework that is called the learner's journey. And then Grant will talk about how at his uh, school at ISEC, uh, he's been using this framework actually applying it to the context of ISEC and uh, and looking at how in higher education you can use uh, a learning design framework in that way. And then we would uh, send you into some breakout rooms thinking about how this might resonate with what you're doing, how you're uh, helping other people learn and then bring that back together. And that would be our, our full and done. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, if we go to the next slide, Grant, I think this is where we have that framework. So this is essentially just one slide uh, that uh, I'm, I'm using here to describe this. Um, the learner's journey is a framework that thinks of learners as a protagonist of their own adventure, of their own journey, of their own uh, as being the hero of a journey of transformation. And so why, <laughs> why is that? It comes from the idea that most people experience their lives or at least memorable experiences in story form. We tend to not uh, remember facts or, or numbers very well, but we tend to be able to remember stories and the emotions we felt during stories and how something played out in a in an anecdotal kind of way. And we use stories a lot in training settings, right? We use case studies. We use all kinds of different ways. We create experiential learning experiences that are very much a story within the learning design. But what I'm proposing with the learner's journey is that you can think the entire learning process as a story form. And so 
many of you may be uh, familiar with uh, the hero's journey uh, it was developed in the in the 60s by joseph campbell and uh, and then later on in the in the 2000s dan harman uh, created from the hero's journey a much simpler framework called this the story circle the story circle has uh, eight steps yeah? so there's a protagonist the protagonist has a need uh, goes into the unknown searches uh, or is exposed to adventure is exposed to not knowing how things work and then finds some kind of an insight takes this insight and returns back into the known world and you can put this on any romantic comedy you've ever watched any action movie you've ever seen any fantasy movie you've ever seen this is the lord of the rings this is star wars this is harry potter this is when harry met sally and this is uh maybe it's i mean it's love actually many many times over uh and um any story that is a, a mainstream success essentially follows this um, story structure. Why? Because uh, we we tend to experience life in this way. Life goes from uh, uh, things that are then stop existing and then being reborn as well. We have that in the way how our seasons work from um, spring into summer, then winter, and um, no, then autumn and winter, and then spring again. We know this with the lives of the people around us. Some people come into our lives, some people exit our lives. Life and death is also, uh, as Elton John sang beautifully about in The Lion King, it's the circle of life. Yeah? And so we tell stories in this way, but we don't only tell stories in this way, we also experience significant experiences in this same way. And we predominantly experience our own life in this way. So we are the protagonist that is at the center of a story that we tell about ourselves. And so any meaningful learning experience essentially gets stored as a memory in this form after the fact. And so what we can do as educators or as trainers or as coaches or as uh, the consultants who are all in the business of being companions of transformation, I would say, um, can use this format, can use this framework to structure learning experiences, putting the learner as the protagonist, as the hero or the heroine of their own story, and then helping them go through the journey towards change, meaning that we need to base the learning experience in the world and in the identity of the learner of the protagonist identify a need that they have where the world how it is isn't how they would like it to be yeah? and if we don't have, have this need clearly and we don't have this gap between how things are and how things could be or should be clearly defined then very often there isn't a lot of motivation to go into the unknown and be exposed to new information or to new experiences so this really drives the motivation and then we bring them, we go into the unknown, where to go into the unknown, you need to have two factors. It needs to be relevant to the change you seek, but it also needs to be safe enough that you know you can fail, you know you can fall down and somebody there will be there to pick you up. There is a Gandalf to your Frodo, there is a Dumbledore to your Harry Potter, there is a, um, a Luke Skywalker to your Rey, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you can fall down. Uh, and be picked up again and you can experiment with new ideas and new experiences and then you might find what it is that was there for you to find and that can be different for different learners on different learning journeys but where we can make space as a learner uh, as a learning companion and as a trainer and as a facilitator is to provide opportunities to explore what we might have found what the learner may have found and to see how we can uh, turn that into something I once heard about to something I am now the kind of person that knows this. Yeah, and in cooperation, we turn make this a part of who we are. This is not anymore something that I once heard. This is now something that I am. This is now I am now the kind of person that has this competence because I turned it from something that I was exposed to to something that is now part of me. And then we return and actually bring this back into the world outside of the classroom, outside of the training room, outside of the, the coaching session. And we can uh, 
kind of bring peace or harmony to the gap that was before and now it is a closed gap and we are now the kind of person that has arrived maybe even at a different place than we were aiming for in the beginning because maybe what we find put us on a slightly different path but we have returned to the world that is outside of the educational setting where we implement these things that we've learned yeah very very quick overview if you're interested in finding out more there's a, a whole book about it but uh, i would now uh, hand over to uh, to grant to see how he and his colleagues at uh, iesec have used this framework to um to turn it into a lived experience by of thousands of people Thank you, Bastian. It's always nice to hear you talk about this. It reminds me of why we're doing what we're doing and not really trying to do what we're doing. Um, I, I make no pretense of having found a, a perfect solution to, to anything. We're trying, uh, given the context that we have, to, to make sense of, uh, uh, of our situation and our environment and, and make it work. Um, as best we can for for our students so <clears throat> let me <clears throat> perhaps begin just by giving you a little bit of context um as bastian said uh, i work at ESEG uh, school of, of management some of you i know already know ESEG some of you i worked there before some of you still work there now uh ESEG is a uh, management school based in Lille in the north of France and in in Paris. Um, as Bastien mentioned earlier, it will be ESEG that hosts next year's CETA Europa Congress. So from the 5th to the 8th of June, 2024, please come and join us at ESEG in, in Lille for the next Congress. Um, ESEG has the triple crown. So we have the three international uh, accreditations, the EQUIS, the AMBER, the AACSB. Um, we have over 100 nationalities on the campus. 82% uh, of our permanent professors are not French. They come from 50 uh, different countries. So most of them uh, are like me, not, so not uh, native French. Uh, speakers or nationals. Um, a lot of our staff, our administrative staff now are also not French. Um, and so we've become a very international um, organization in a, in a relatively um, in a relatively short time. Um, in 2015, um, ESEG decided to go through a deep visioning process. We'd been changing very quickly. And so we decided to take stock of where we were and who we were. And so over a period of about 18 months, we went out and we uh, questioned all our stakeholders, our students, our corporate um, partners, the, the staff, uh, just to try and see what they felt about our values, what they felt about our mission, et cetera. And after gathering all the information, we went away about 350 people for three days and we co-created a vision for the school. And the vision of the school is this. Uh, in 2025, ESEG will be a unique international hub empowering change makers for a better society. Um, and one of the things we saw running through everything that we'd done was that the international dimension, the intercultural dimension was present basically uh, everywhere uh, across the school. Um, 2025 is tomorrow. Um, earlier this year, we went and we revisited this vision uh, and 400 of us went away again for a few days for a, um, a residential seminar and we asked a very basic question which was uh, is this vision still relevant today and we came up with the answer that yes uh, this vision is still relevant to us today and will be our guiding principle for the new strategic plan um, so beyond 2025 with with this vision we also came up with a mission and the mission of the school is in three lines. Um, 
the, the first one is the most important one for me because I'm actually the intercultural uh, track coordinator at the school. So I coordinate all the intercultural communication, intercultural management courses, diversity courses, etc. And the first line of our mission says that we are there to educate managers to be inspiring, intercultural and ethical pioneers of change. Um, so we actually have it in black and white that we're there to educate intercultural um, managers. Uh, we're there to create knowledge that nurtures innovative leaders and to promote creative solutions for and with responsible organizations. Um, so that's uh, the vision, that's the mission, that's a little bit about uh, the school that I'm working in. Um, Yes, like I said, became very international very quickly, and it, it also grew very, very quickly, and that's been a challenge, um, and so we've had to come up with an approach to, to deal with this. Um, so one of the things we try to do is to make uh, CQ, cultural intelligence, part of the DNA of everyone involved in life at ESEG, the staff, the students, all our collaborators. Uh, we use a framework, which many of you will probably know, which is the four R's. So this is Funds Trump and R's. Uh, recognize what is culture, what are cultural differences, respect, reconcile, and realize and root. Uh, as I say, we use this, this idea of cultural intelligence. And the, behind this, we have a, a desire really to provide everybody with a working together toolbox and a unique individual experience for each student. Uh, this is this is a challenge at two levels. Um, firstly, because like most management schools, at least in France, uh, the students at ESEG follow a cursus. So they all follow basically the same classes. They have pretty limited options until they get to uh, the third year of their bachelor's and into master's. The other challenge we have is that our student numbers have grown very quickly. So we're now dealing with 1,400 students a year, um, which is quite a lot of students on two different campuses. So how can we make that uh, an individual uh, experience for all of them? One of the other challenges that we've had and we were sort of grappling with for a long time was how can we get the students to take a holistic approach to their studies and not just see their studies as a list of courses that they have to validate to get grades to get their diploma um, etc and, and actually look at the, the thing as as a whole uh, and, and make some sense of that and that's something we'd been um, struggling with for for quite a long time and then Along came this book that Bastian was waving about earlier on, uh, The Learner's Journey. So this was uh, this was in 2019. So how, how did ESA get involved with The Learner's Journey? Well, um, first of all, Bastian persuaded me to buy his book uh, and read it, which I did with great pleasure. Um, and I was so taken with it that um, the, the Eureka moment, the next year, um, we asked Bastian to come along to school and actually present the whole concept um, during our uh, intercultural engagement week. And we introduced it uh, into one of our courses, which was uh, understanding cultural diversity. Uh, uh, the Un understanding cultural diversity course is a course which all of our bachelors and first years have to do. So 1,400 um, students were doing this. Um, it went pretty well. So 2021, 2022, we incorporated the learner's journey into the responsibility seminar uh, and a course in creativity. So again, this is something all of the students do um, at the very start of their program. So in the first weeks when they arrive at the school. Um, we continue to develop that uh, last year and this year, we're trying to build on our experience and trying to uh, to develop the idea. So it's very much a work in progress. We, we, we haven't finished. Um, we need to integrate this and, and really get this uh, rooted in, in everything we do. But uh, how, how, are we actually, how are we actually doing this? The, the idea in the learner's journey of seeing life as a story really spoke to us. And so what we try to get the students to do is to see their time with us at school as, as a story, a learner's journey 
where they are the hero and we want them to make their story a story worth telling. So we want them to really take control and, and have agency over their studies and become the hero of a, of a blockbuster. Um, something that they're just so incredibly proud of. They want to go and tell everybody about it um, whenever they get the, the chance. Their stories obviously are made up of, of different parts because my job is um, being the coordinator of the intercultural track. What particularly interests me is their intercultural story, uh, but it's not the only story. They obviously have other stories within them. So how, how do we try and do this? Um, let's say 1,400 students. So we introduced the concept of the learner's journey uh, to the students in the responsibility seminar. So that takes place in the first weeks of the first semester. So we're actually doing this at the moment and with Bernd, uh, who's here, we've been doing this for the last, uh, the last 10 days or so. The responsibility seminar is designed to introduce the students to the values, the vision of the school and the teaching and learning policy. And so right from the start, we try and get them looking at their their studies as as a journey as a as a story we we use a pecha kucha format um, where students are invited to co-create an inspiring innovative ethical and socially responsible uh, concept uh, and to find a solution to a problem that is meaningful and engaging to each of the groups so here we're using uh, in a creativity course we're using the uh, the UN SDGs uh, to try and engage the students in uh, in this process and we lead them through the story cycle as they identify the the problem they want to address they set out to find the solution uh, they go through the journey and we try and get them to go through and imagine the the change they want to see at the end of this so this is how we introduce one of the ways we introduce the uh, the learner's journey concept to them and take them through the, the cycle. One of the other things we do at the start, uh, the students do different um, individual profiles. So they do a diversity icebreaker profile, which some of you probably know. This is a profile that allows them to look at their personal preferences for communication and collaboration. They do a cultural intelligence survey, which gives them a profile on their cultural intelligence, cultural competence, metacognition. And we also look at learning styles. Um, a lot of our first year students are French. The big majority of the students in the first year of the bachelors are French. So we don't have a lot of um, diversity to a certain extent at that level. So we use these different profiles to show them the diversity that exists within, within the groups. Based on the individual profiles, we get them to write a personal SWOT, um, which is a starting point to get them thinking about where they are, and we get them thinking about how they got to, uh, to that point uh, already, and then they write an individual intercultural development plan for the coming three, three years. So we try to get them projecting themselves forward. Um, and imagining what their story is going to be look like and how they can uh, influence this, this story. As of this year, the students will now have to do um, a reflexive piece of work at the end of their three-year bachelor cycle where they will evaluate where they've come from, where they've arrived, and where they want to go as they prepare to move into the uh, master's cycle. This was missing before. And we're trying to close this cycle now and actually get them to reflect on, okay, where did I begin? Where have I been? Where am I now? Where am I going? And, and what do I need to, to get there? In some ways, the start of a, a second story or learner's journey for them. And in the future, we hope to have individual logbooks for each of the students so they can chart their progress on the learner's journey. Um, you can imagine the challenge, the logistic challenge that poses when you've got 1,400 students uh, to, to do this. At the moment, we do have, through the three years, they do have a couple of moments where they can, with coaching sessions, et cetera, reflect on where they are, where they've come from, where they're going. Uh, we, we need to uh, develop that a little bit more if we, if we can. Um, 
that's pretty much sort of the start, the very start. And then now this this final piece that we've brought in um, for the reflection at the end of their, of their bachelors. What we try to do through all of this, as I said, is to get the students to develop their cultural intelligence um, and to make their learner's journey personal. So some of the things that allow them to do this, I mentioned the responsibility seminar. So they do their personal SWATs, they do their individual intercultural development plans, etc. cetera. Um, they have to work on a solidarity project, which we currently do with UNESCO. Again, as part of that, we think about the learner's journey uh, and the the, uh, the story cycle again. So we're re-injecting this and bringing it back to the to the surface for them. Um, the cultural diversity passport is something all of the bachelor students have to do, where they have to go out and individually meet somebody who is culturally different from themselves over a semester, and have at least three meetings, hopefully more meetings, which they then um makes more videos about and we get them to reflect on what they've learned the skills they've used in these meetings etc all of our students have to do at least one semester of study abroad so this is obviously a way they can very much make their stories personal in the choice of country they go to the choice of university they go to they have a choice of over 370 partner universities in 76 different countries if I remember um, so this gives them a, um, a very large choice there one of the things we also do is we try to limit the number of our students who go to any one university so they're not going 20 30 40 students together there are three or four maximum students from uh, the university that are from ESAQ who are there all students must get at least six months of international internships. So again, this is a, a good way for them to make their journeys and their stories very personal. And then obviously everything that is involved with their student associations, their clubs, their social life, this is another way that they can uh, invest time and energy in things that are particularly of relevance to, to them as, as individuals. And, and and many many other things uh, which you can probably imagine so these are these are some of the ways that the the students will be encouraged to uh, invest in their learner's journey and make their story the the blockbuster that we want it to be and and for them to come out being the, the change makers we uh, we want them to be as as well that I think very quickly is uh, about all I wanted to say about how how we are, are trying to do it. There there are lots of dots there. There are still lots of dots we have to join up. Um, one of the things I think we need to do and we need to work on is making sure that the whole concept of the learner's journey and the story cycle is shared by as many of the faculty as possible. So they they are also working. Uh, using this this kind of framework, uh, and they can perhaps see how what they do fits fits into this. Um, at the moment, it's very much uh, an idea that is carried by the diversity team, um, by the creativity team, and the, the people involved in the the responsibility seminar at the start. Um, and this needs to be reinforced, I think, so that as they go through the the second year, the third year, we keep bringing this back in so they, they don't lose sight of this whole this whole idea. That's me done, I think. Yeah. I think maybe a, a component I can add to that because not everyone has access like Grant has to uh you know a tie an entire three year bachelor's degree, but maybe some of you are are teaching um one semester course at a university and uh, similar to what I do, and I teach a course in intercultural communication here at the university, and we use the uh, the learner's journey framework just for that one seminar in one semester. And so there we start with a lesson on identity, and then the students have to write an essay uh, entitled, Who Are You and Why? 
And then uh, we go through the semester with different experiences, different uh, self-designed research projects, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end of it, they have to write a second essay uh, entitled, what have you learned and what will you do with it? So also there we try to to go through this uh, uh, circle of being very individualized, very personal, uh, encouraging reflection, and then um, providing an opportunity to be exposed to very different ideas, to very different challenges, to very different scenarios, to very different experiences, and then not telling them what they have to learn from it, but encouraging to think about what they have learned from it and how that can apply to the space outside of the uh, of the seminar room. Uh, so you can apply this, what I find useful about this framework is you can apply to a three-year uh, university degree, you can apply it to a one seminar over one semester, you can apply it to a a one-day training course, a two-day training course, or even a one-and-a-half-hour um, workshop. And um, I, I appreciate the, the flexibility that the framework has there. Bastian, we, I, I took an example there of our main, our sort of um, flagship degree program there. But we also used this last year uh, in a one-year course, um, in our Bachelor of International Business course. And we asked the students, one part of their evaluation in the final semester was to do, we like picture culture um, presentations. Um, so the, if, if anybody doesn't know picture culture, Pachachka is 20 slides, 20 seconds per slide. Uh, that makes a six minute 40, uh, very focused presentation. Uh, and we asked the students to do a uh, Pachachka presentation about their learner's journey in the first year. And the results were really, really, really good. Um, we were incredibly impressed by what they did. And th the engagement of the students was, was really quite special. Uh, they really got into it. They really enjoyed doing it. And they came up with some really excellent work. Um, so that's, that's something we've would be doing um, again and trying to reinforce sort of how we how we do that. So it's it's not just over the three year um, mm. things. You, you as you Excellent. say, you can use it different. Yeah, of course. All right. So we were thinking of uh, giving you some time without without us <laughs> uh, to actually think about how this might apply to your working context. How this might apply to your um, space, to the people you work with, to the processes that you are involved in. Um, do we have um, the uh, the question, uh, uh, Grant, that we uh, were uh, trying to stimulate those discussions? You're muted now. I think the question was a question that you just framed. So how okay. can you, can you um, imagine using the framework uh, the learner's journey uh, framework the, the story cycle in in what you do are you doing something that is similar to this perhaps or already does uh what bastian has said or what what we're trying to do at ESEG has this given you any ideas and uh, uh really um just take about 15 minutes i think we we said yeah. best I, yeah, let's little, uh, let's have a look. A uh, so maybe fifteen minutes is a little too much. Maybe let's uh, say eight, uh, and and then bring everybody back. Yeah, and how many breakout rooms? I would say uh, maybe we're twenty six people, so maybe let's say five. Cindy's trying to say something. I think. Um... Yes. Um... I think four or five people to the breakout room and a uh, there's a Michelle uh, asking why we can't do this in the larger group. We are quite a big group with very little time. And so if we go into breakout rooms, it gives more people the chance to talk. Uh, if we stay in a big group, yes, we would hear everybody. But we would hear from very few people. And so uh, Grant and I wanted to see that we give the most amount of people the most amount of time 
uh, everyone can have to um, to talk. So that was our thinking behind this. Oh, for okay. breakout rooms. Yep. If you set up breakout rooms, because I keep coming and going. I am, yeah, yeah, we we've got this, Cindy. No worries. Okay, I'm going to send everybody flying okay. across cyberspace now for eight minutes, and then we'll bring you back and we'll discuss what you have been talking about. And we should pause the recording. Uh, resume recording. All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, I hope you had a, a great and stimulating conversations in your in your smaller groups. We we were wondering if in those conversations any questions came up that you wanted to uh, to bring to either to us and challenge us with your questions, or to bring also to the the larger group and see how other people relate to to what you were maybe you know, rumbling with there. Anybody has something that they wanted to to bring to this context here? Yeah, Elizabeth. Uh, I just, somebody said something at the end, um, just as we were being pulled back that fascinated me. If you structure the whole thing as a journey, it doesn't end when the course is over. It no. doesn't end when university is done. Um, it gives students a framework to to carry on and grow continue growing i thought that was wonderful mm. yeah and you can structure the end as a beginning uh and uh, just like uh, every time you go on a journey and you come back home you also kind of know that you can leave again and go on a different adventure yeah uh, uh, please f1 yes um hi bastian and grant and hi everyone um yeah, I, I, I really resonate with the thought that um, the speaker before me just shared um, that I can imagine that some of the model can be very sustainable if after the workshop, the, the, the participants can also reuse the model again. So in our breakout session, we um, only had the time to discuss a little bit about the settings of trainings and coachings that we are uh, having in, in mind right now um, and uh, didn't have the time to share the, you know, the applications, how we concretely um, adapt the model into our work. Um, I have a, um, a thought on, uh, you know, shorter um, training timeframes in terms of, thank you, Bastian, for sharing your last thought with us that the model can be adapted uh, to shorter uh, timeframes or shorter frames uh, of, the, um, of the trainings or teaching. Um, I am wondering uh, whether um, you could share a little bit about your thoughts on the crucial uh, steps of this model um, that you think um, they should be uh, addressed uh, even yeah. in, in the shorter time frame. Yes, absolutely. So I think a, a big challenge that we often have when we are under time pressure is that we dedicate a lot of the attention to the search phase. So the exposure to new knowledge, the exposure to new experiences, but we don't actually uh, spend enough time centering the learner, centering them and their world and what is important for them and what kind of change they would like to see in the world. And I think this is where when you see, or at least I know when I was in school and I was not paying attention, <laughs> it was because I had the feeling this is not for me. This person is talking about something they are interested in, but they are, I'm irrelevant here. And I think if we can focus on one thing, it is to really center the learner and make sure that they don't only feel like this is relevant to them, but that it is relevant to them that it it resonates with who they are and where they would like to be and who they would like to be and what they are curious about and then everything that you offer then will be taken up with with joy and gratitude because it it's for them it's this idea of i see you yeah and to me being a, a companion on someone else's learning path is an act of love 
it's an act of I need to see you. I need to love the humanity in you and where you are and your potential and where you could be. And if what I have to share with you is irrelevant to you, then it's not you that has to change. It's me that has to amplify my empathy for you to see how I can relate and resonate more with you. You are a companion on someone else's journey. That means that you have to be invited into it. And so that is, I think, where I would put the majority of the attention. And then whatever you do after that is is a relational exercise of exploration and challenge. It doesn't mean that, ah, oh, let me make things easy for you. No, it also means I, I see you and I see what you don't see and where you don't see yourself going. And I want to challenge you. I think you have more potential on this. I think you have more curiosity in yourself. Let me provide you with something that is challenging to you, not because I want to be mean to you, but because it's an expression of, uh, of of love and care for you and so this is where i would put the the main focus there if pressed for time but i would put the main focus there also if not pressed for time because i think it's it's really the core of it can i say best what you know what we found is especially with younger students so you know, that some of our students are only 17 18 is is also really focusing on the need and the motivation and getting them to think about you know really why are they there what are they looking for um and and it's not often something they've spent a lot of time thinking about you know they've, they've just gone through high school they've just turned up there and their parents have had a big influence etc but it's you know it's what do you want and again putting them like you say putting them right at the center of, of the whole thing and making the whole thing about about them but helping them you know make the effort they need to make to understand what it is they're they're looking for and maybe one more thing is uh, if I have a, a short amount of time, I go immediately into experience. So very little talking, immediately into an experiential learning exercise, immediately into doing, feeling, engaging, being active. Uh, and all kinds of short experiential learning exercises are very, very effective because what they do is they engage you emotionally and they give you a question mark. And they give you a thinking of, oh, I thought I react like this, but I react like that. I wonder why. And then you go into the talking, not first talking, then experiencing, but immediately into experience. With that, you give them an experience of being there, of being centered, of being active, of being present. Uh, and then from that comes a question mark. And from that question mark comes the theory uh, that can relate to that question mark. Uh, Pascal, your your hand yes, I have another. I have a question and a comment. Uh, I like it very much. I like this uh, learner centric uh, approach. Uh, but autonomy in learning is not um, it's not overall that people value autonomous learning. They are culture where people need really the connection with the teacher. The the and uh, I was wondering whether when you have in an audience a mix of learners, some of them have been conditioned to learn, uh, you know, in close interdependence with the, the, um, the trainer or, or the teacher. What sort of warning or what sort of comment do you give them? Do you say that this is the best way to learn? Or do you tell them, look, that's how we learn here? helping them to reflect on their own way of learning. Can you tell me a little bit about, you know, this, this yeah. question that I have that I wonder? Sure. <laughs> I, I tend to not talk about the framework when in the learning experience, because then we're on the meta level and we're thinking about what we're thinking and not actually thinking. So I tend to not uh, say, okay, here's the framework of this uh course mm -hmm. or of this training course but because it starts with centering the learner it doesn't mean you have to be like that it means i'm curious in who you are and what your way is that helps you learn and so if that for you means that you you sometimes really want my opinion of on something i will you know give you my opinion including why i think my opinion isn't the most relevant thing around here uh, but it it's a relational thing. That means that each one of us needs to be present fully with our own ideas. With, But of course, 
power is also always there. Yeah, and uh, with uh, you know, Spider Man said it nicely, or his uncle. Uh, with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah, and so sometimes, of course, it's it's nice and easy to be able to lean back and say everyone is going to be doing what I tell them anyway. Uh, but then you can play with that and you can say, okay, let's turn this around for one session only. Or you can say, okay, let's see what is valuable about that and what maybe it might hinder you and what that means for when you're outside of the learning room, et cetera, et cetera. So I think you can um, yeah, play with that. But because at least philosophically and fundamentally, it starts with centering the learner. It means whoever is there is there with their personality, their culture, their trauma, their abilities, their potentials, their, uh, you know, their lightnings, et cetera. And then you work with whoever is there and uh, and engage with them as who they are and not who you'd like them to be. Okay, but don't you think people from culture where there's this kind of interdependence, people get confused with the instruction, have never been, you know, going through that and need maybe even special support? So, or do they learn that that's the best way to learn? And do you think it's the best way to learn and that you would say that learner-centric is better than other arts? I don't even say teacher-centric because I think mm -hmm. that when you say teacher centric, there are many different realities there. But I mean, uh, especially if we teach intercultural skills, we learn to respect mm. different ways. And so, how far do we go into respecting cultural differences? Do we need to respect the the, the learner prefer um, training style? I've read articles about it, and I also myself as a as a trainer got feedback from participants who uh, wanted to have another approach because they think they learn best under th these conditions. So it's good as an experiment, but I think it should be people should be able to make sense of the experience. Yeah, and I think for some it's easier to relate to it. For others, it's uh, it's a little bit more difficult. But, but I uh, think that there's a, a few things that that hold true across cultures. It's that learning leads to the generation of memories. Mm -hmm. Memories are stored generally in story form, and so whatever cultural background someone has, they're going to remember what they experienced with you in story form anyway. So you can structure it in story form to make the retention more effective that okay. doesn't mean that you immediately have to say okay you now need to be active but people are are going to relate to that with who they are and how they show up and then you as a as a learning companion it is your responsibility to engage with the full person that you have in front of you and say i am interested in you i'm curious about what you are curious about and if that is manga, that is manga. If that is K-pop, that is K-pop. Or if that is, uh, you know, uh, martial arts, that's martial arts. And if that's climbing, that's climbing. Okay, cool. How can we tap into what you're interested in and, and relate to what I want to share with you and see how what you're interested in and what I'm here to teach you connect with each other? And that is, there's no universal way there. There's only a relational way. And the relation is always there. I'm not, I'm not sure, Bastian, how many, because a lot of people here uh, work in higher education. Um, I mean, one of the things we do, and I think this is also the case in British universities, I'm not sure about elsewhere, but I mean, we, we teach Kolb's experiential learning cycle to everybody. And they do a learning styles profile so that you know they they understand what is their preferred learning style um and and we sort of link that in that that's part of the you know getting to know themselves so that they can better understand and better collaborate with 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 other people uh and so there's not you know it's it's there's not just one approach to it and when you're doing the the, the learner's journey or the story cycle you know you, you also need to be going through the uh the the learning styles circle um so, so that it's fully uh it's fully integrated by everybody all right i think we're also okay. at the end of our yeah. time uh, so we you are, can we are. 
Grant and myself uh, through all the usual ways. Uh, I think we're both very easy to find. So uh, don't uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, uh, and um, and thank you very much for inviting us today. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you. Justin and Grant. Thank you. Uh, that was that was very interesting. And uh, this is just I need one minute to announce.